World War Three has begun. People aren't hip to the scene. Netanyahu's on his own. He's not going to do what America tells him to do, and he's doing what he wants to do. The United States has lost control of this. The world has had enough of America's geopolitical and economic hegemony. If the Arab nations put an embargo on oil because of what Israel is doing, that's it, man. Oil prices will skyrocket. The global economy will crash. There's going to be a banking crisis the likes of which we've never seen before. You can see gold prices easily to 3,000. When all else fails, they take you to war. And the Samson option again is what? They have between 200 to 400 nuclear warheads. And if they go down, they're taking everybody down with them. These are mentally deranged people. It's going to be annihilation of life on earth. This isn't only in the United States. It's global. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Well, it's an honor to once again have the Oracle of OSINT, Gerald Salente, the man himself, trends forecaster, author of the Trends Journal. I would strongly suggest that after this interview, you go and check it out because that is a compendium, a wealth of data-driven analysis. He's got a podcast on YouTube as well, and it's a very uh, passionate podcast, we'll say, and he lets you know how he feels. He doesn't hold back. In fact, he says that's the secret to his health. So uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. I think the last time we spoke, probably 18 months ago, you made a prediction that gold was going to bottom at $1,850. You were very close. It bottomed at 1830 And I got to hand it to you because the price of gold right now, where is it? Twenty-three forty-five and ninety cents, my friend. What the hell is going on? It's one of your top trends for twenty twenty-four in your trends journal. A golden year for gold. We said this back on January second, and gold's up about three hundred bucks since then. And by the way, you could also listen to the trends journal too. There's an audio, and it's in all different languages as well. But going back to gold, it's very simple. We said that two reasons are going to drive, there are three reasons actually. One of them is geopolitical unrest. World War Three has begun. People aren't hip to the scene. What's going on in Ukraine war, we said they're going to keep ramping this up as they keep losing. And one of our top trends for 2023 was Middle East meltdown. We warned this was going to happen. Tracking trends is the understanding of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. And we're political atheists. We don't take sides on anything. We call it the way it is. There are no advertisers in the Trends Journal. And so as we see what's going on, let's go to the wars. They're going to ramp it up in Ukraine. They're losing. So they're going to keep ramping it up to get more money. And you don't have to believe me, little boy over there, that's the... uh, the so NATO get- General Secretary Stoltenberg. Oh. We want a hundred thousand dollars more to, so we could send to Ukraine so they can defeat Russia. Because if if we lose the Ukraine war, then all of Europe and all of the world will be at risk. That's the kind of stuff they're putting out there. Now we go to the Middle East war. Let's see. Israel killed how many people in Lebanon? Oh, 52 in Syria. Oh, and then they bombed the uh Iranian consulate in Syria, which, by the way, is a violation of the Geneva Convention and other laws because you're not supposed to bomb embassies or other consulates. Oh, and oh, also they also wiped out three uh, oil and refinery area uh, fields in, in Iran. Oh, and and um, Ukraine knocked out 15 percent of Russia's oil production. So now let's put everything together. Let's go back. And what when was oil prices? Brent crude was selling for around $73, $74 a barrel. Now what's it at? It's almost 92. 92. Oh, what's that going to do with inflation? Let's go back to gold. People are buying gold. Governments are buying gold because they see the geopolitical unrest. Now let's go to the bottom line. Hey, remember the COVID war? Oh, it was launched on January 20th, 2020 in China on this Chinese Lunar New Year, the year of the rat. People forget 
Germany was almost in a recession in 2019. There were protests going on all over the world, the yellow vest in France, uh, in Algeria, India, uh, Chile, Peru, all South Africa, all over the world. People were taking to streets, lack of basic living standards, government corruption, crime and violence. The economies were going down in 2019. The COVID war breaks out. Lock down your businesses. Stay at home. Don't worry about it. Here's some money. Hey, we're going to bring interest rates down to zero. Yeah, keep them negative over there in Europe. Here's more free money, more free money, more free money. Oh, what's the United States debt? Oh, officially, only about $35 trillion, going up only a trillion dollars every 100 days. Can't understand why gold prices are going up. Oh, over there in China, where they had three years of COVID, zero COVID policy, and they already had a housing crisis that was going to happen anyway, because when economies boom, there's always a bust. And then they locked down for three years, 30%, according to some of the stats of China's GDP is real estate related. And the real estate is in the toilet. Gold sales in China this year in the retail sector, the consumers is up 24%. So when we look at the economic data, all the phony money that was flooded into the markets, the war's going on, and then there's another one. The presidential reality show that morons and imbeciles call the presidential elections. You got Mickey Mouse running against Donald Duck. Anyway, they do it all the time. They lower interest rates in the run-up to the presidential election. To keep the power in power in power. Who is the United States Treasury Secretary? Janet Yellen. What was the last job? Oh, you mean she was the head of the Federal Reserve? Wait a minute. You mean the head of the Federal Reserve is now the U.S. Treasury Secretary? Yeah, that's right. That's who's running the show. Hell, this was the cover of one of our trends journals back in 2011. The Prince of Peace becoming violent to drive the money changes out of the temple. Nothing's changed. So the lower interest rates go, the deeper the dollar falls, the deeper the dollar falls, the higher gold prices go. Those are the energies driving up gold. And this is just the beginning. So what happens if they have to raise interest rates? Wouldn't the price of oil going up, wouldn't that force them to do the reverse? They, rise, they raise interest rates, the economy goes down. They're going to do everything they can to pump up the economy in the run-up to the elections. They do it all the time. So you think that they're going to do that in an attempt to keep Biden in office? Yep. They got to keep Powell, uh, to keep the Treasury. Again, look at who the Treasury Secretary is. I'll tell you a very quick story. You ever hear of John Connolly? Rings a bell. John Connolly was the governor of Texas that sat in front of JFK, John F. Kennedy, that took the bullet in the back. I have a photograph of me and John Connolly and his wife in front of the book depository, 1992. He wanted to meet me because in one of my books, Trend Tracking, Far Better Than Megatrends, Time Magazine, is two weeks before the presidential election. I said that there'd be a new third party. I wrote that in 89. And someone like Ross Perot would be the person. So Connolly wanted to meet me. I have a photograph of me, him, and his wife in front of the book depository. The first time back since the assassination. I'm making a very long story short to show you. And I'm going back to Treasury Secretary and why we're keeping him in power. We're walking back into the Anatole Hotel. And he said to me, I read your book. He says, it's a fine piece of work. And I know your heart's in the right place, but you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither did the American people, because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Remember, this is a John Connolly, the Democrat that took the bullet in the back. You know what his other job was? Treasury Secretary under Richard Nixon, a Republican that took us off the gold stamp. They're going to do everything they can to stay in power. So they're going to lower interest rates. It's going to be the beginning of the death of the dollar. The world has had enough 
of America's geopolitical and economic hegemony. You're looking at the bricks in one after another. So what are your predictions then for this precious metal boom that we're seeing right now? How long do you think this can continue and how high do you think it's going to go? You can see gold prices easily to 3000 And this is important. If there wasn't a Bitcoin out there, gold prices would be up much higher. But what's going on, like a place like Argentina, you have what your inflation rates running like 250%. The average person can't buy gold. So they're buying Bitcoin because they're seeing their, their currencies going to garbage. Turkey, what do you got, 60, 70% inflation rate? So the people are buying Bitcoin. If that wasn't there, it'd go much higher. But you're going again, you're seeing the central bank's record buying of gold. They know how bad it is. And again, everything was artificially inflated by printing money backed by nothing and printed on nothing. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Are you a Bitcoin guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Again, to me, it's the gamble. You know, gold is a different play. But Bitcoin, I, I, we've been going bullish on Bitcoin, you know, for years. And, um, uh, we're, what we're saying is the only time that we see cryptocurrencies ending is when the banks go to central bank digital currency, CBDCs, because they're not going to want any competition. So you think that and that's some, years away. at some point, Bitcoin might be outlawed or? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they did it in China. Remember? You know, so you know, they're going to do everything again. Don't believe me, believe the Prince of Peace. These are the cats running the show. Some people might say, like the precious metal purists, they might say that, well, you know, right now the media is talking about Bitcoin. They're talking about cryptocurrency because they're trying to keep the attention there and keep the attention away from the precious metals market because the central banks are buying it. Uh, the bigs, as you call them, are buying it. I love that, by the way. Isn't there potentially an ulterior motive here to try to, distract people with this cryptocurrency stuff while the real money is buying up the gold? Absolutely. You're 100% correct. And again, we should be, the Trends Journal should be headline news. Again, you look at your top trends for 2024, a golden year for gold, January 2nd. Here we are. You're more into Bitcoin, like for the speculative aspect of it? Like yes. The, okay. Yep. Fair yep. enough. And what about silver? Are you a silver person? I'm a silver person too, but silver hasn't hasn't played the game out that it, you know, I I I bought silver back at the time, you know, forty dollars an ounce, you know, back at a different time. But it's not going up the way I believed it should have, being that silver is used in all the computer materials, you know, cell phones, everything else. And unlike gold, after you, the thing dies, it's buried, you know, so you're not restoring it and all of the solar paneling and on and on and on and on and on. You would think the silver prices would be much higher, but you know, I don't. You don't think it's going to go up from here? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Fair enough. I I would have thought it would have gone up, and it hasn't gone up, so I don't know. What are your predictions for the banks? I know you have some pretty ominous uh, forecasts for what's going to happen with the banks if uh, interest rates uh, stay elevated. I guess it goes one way: interest rates stay elevated, the banks crash, or. Uh, interest rates get lower and the dollar crashes. So what are your forecasts for the banks? And then maybe you could talk a little bit about um, commercial and, and residential real estate after that. Well, the commercial real estate goes right to the banks. Again, tracking trends is the understanding of where we are, how we got here and where we're going. Let's go back to the COVID war. You can't go to work. Go home. You're going to work remotely. So now people are staying home week after week, week after month after month, year after year, and they're saying to myself, themselves, I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning to commute an hour and a half each way, spending all this dough. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm ruining my life. Now, let's say I'm the guy that has 300 people in 10 floors or whatever, and they're all sitting in cubicles. I don't see them anyway. Yeah, stay home. I don't need all this space. So let's look at the facts. Your office vacancy rate, meaning nobody in them, in New York City, 23%. Vacant, no one there. Let's take a trip to uh, Portland, Oregon. 
Portland was hot before COVID. 29% office vacancy rate. On average in America, the top cities, 20% vacancy, empty buildings. Now let's look at the office occupancy rate, meaning people going back to work. According to Castle Systems with a K, 51.6% occupancy. Now, I'm the building owner. You have, in the next year and a half, $2 trillion worth of office building commercial real estate coming due. Debt. They're not going to pay. Keep the building. Now, let's go back. Again, all things are connected in trend forecasting. Let's go back to the COVID war when they pumped in all these trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And remember how people's bank accounts were going up, and more savings? And what were the banks doing? Oh, they were buying treasuries. Are you buying treasuries when you got zero interest rate? And now it's worth nothing? And now the banks can't, the, the building owners can't pay their debt on the loans that you loan them the money on? And you don't have the money to cover it? Now, here we are in April. Let's go back to last March. Silicon Valley, the Silicon Con Man Bank busted. Remember what happened to the equity markets? Then Signature and Republic or Republic and the Signature Bank went out. Remember how the markets went way down and gold went way up? Three banks. The latest data is showing nearly 300 banks in the United States are at risk. 300, 282 is the number. There's going to be a banking crisis, the likes of which we've never seen before. Oh, and then they said, we're going to turn them into, you know, apartment buildings or, oh, no, you're not. The building's built, again, oh, we only go by the data. As you said, you read what you, if you don't want to read it, you look at our trend analysis and trend forecast, they're in red. Buildings built in the last 50 years are not convertible to, to residential apartments. They were just steel, nothing glass things with just empty spaces in the middle. You don't have, you know, the water lines going up, electric, you don't have any of that stuff. So there's going to be a banking crisis. And by the way, this isn't only in the United States. It's global. It's global. So how do you see this playing out when you say uh, we're just going to start seeing banks uh, start to collapse one by one and the markets are going to tank, precious metals are going to go up and we just enter a recession, borderline depression situation? Oh, it's just going to be the, the it's going to be the greatest banking crisis in the history of the world, part one and part two. But again, as I keep saying, when all else fails, they take you to war. And you don't have to believe me. Google up, everybody listening, Google up Franklin Roosevelt seizes Japanese assets. Google it up. History, the channel, History Channel will come up. In July of 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt seized all Japanese assets. How come? Why, those dirty Japanese, you know what they did? They invaded French Indochina. Wait a minute. Number one, I'm an American. What do I care about the Japanese going into French Indochina? And why are you calling it French Indochina? You mean because of those lousy French went into Cambodia, Laos, and Vita Vietnam, robbed their rubber, their tin, rape, pillage, and steal everything they can? Oh, those dirty Japanese went in there. And you know what else those Japanese did when they went there? They were so close to the British bases in Shanghai. Why, the sun never sets on the British Empire. They have every right to be there. Oh, and the Dutch in Indonesia stealing and robbing and pillaging? Oh, they were too close as well. The United States, you can look at again, Google it up. It's right there, mainstream. United States, Great Britain, and the Dutch put sanctions on Japan. They lost three quarters of their global trade. And they cut off 88% of their imported oil. They only import 100%. 
can't understand why the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor a couple of months later. Blow me away. When all else fails, they take you to war. The Great Depression was going on. Let's go back to the dot-com bust, which, by the way, right here in your Trends Journal, back in 1999, dot-com bust, dot-com this, we forecast it. It would crash by the second quarter of 2000, right there. United States was in a deep recession. People couldn't stand little Georgie Bush. You know, the daddy's boy, born on third base, thought he had a home run with a, with a brain smaller than a pea. We're going to get that guy Osama bin Laden dead or alive. Following 9-11, everybody forgot about the dot-com bust. Everybody forgot about it. And then they created the fake real estate market. Oh, you remember the one. Don't have a job. Deep in debt. Hey, don't worry about it. Sign over here. We call it a subprime mortgage. Oh, yeah. The banksters did it, right? Oh, the banksters? Oh, that, that Obama bailed out? Oh, that those banksters? $29 trillion, according to the Levy Institute of Bard College, the Federal Reserve dumped into the banking system from 2007 to 2010. When all else fails, they take you to war. That's my greatest concern. 88% of the people swallowed the garbage coming out of little Georgie Bush's mouth. For the so, longest war in American history, the Afghan war. And so we had that, that flashbulb event of 9-11. Yep. Uh, do you foresee another event unfolding that might bring us, or perhaps that was October 7th, uh, but how do you see this war materializing where do you think the united states is going to get involved obviously right now as of this weekend they're really drumming up the threat of the iranian uh, you know retaliation in israel they're stocking up on groceries and they're getting the bomb shelters ready do you feel as though it's going to uh, involve a war between iran and israel or is it just going to be limited to uh Lebanon and Israel, or is this the big one? Is is this how they're going to... Because if you're talking about the mother of all banking crises, they would need the mother of all wars to kind of cover it up. So what do you? what's your forecast for the Middle East in terms of the geopolitical situation? Again, our top trend for 2020, uh, uh, 2023, one of the top trends was Middle East meltdown. We warned that this was going to happen. Again, we only put down the facts. We'll just talk about the Middle East war prior to Hamas attack. Not my language, the language of the mainstream media when Netanyahu came into office at the end of December 2022. Extreme right wing government. Week after week after week after week after week, we're reporting in the Trends Journal the criminality that this extreme right wing government was committing against the people in the West Bank and in Gaza. Just kept it increasing and increasing. Then Netanyahu is being brought on corruption charges, tries to pass this thing called the Judicial Reform Act. The facts are there. Before October 7, 2023, there were 39 weeks of major protests going on in Israel against Netanyahu's judicial reform. The president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, called it a civil war. That's right. A civil war was going on in Israel. Hamas happens. It's all forgotten. Now let's fast forward. Go back to your Trends Journal. We kept warning. If Israel escalates this against Iran, you're going to see oil prices spike. If they hit $130 a barrel, it's going to crash the global equity markets. And the global economy, because again, the whole thing's been artificially propped up with the cheap money from the COVID war. Now, we saw what Israel did by bombing the consulate in Syria. Again, they were bombing over in Syria before that. The week before, they killed 52 people in Aleppo. They killed dozens in Lebanon. Now, Iran has come out and said that they're going to retaliate. And now Israel warns them that they better not retaliate. Okay, so wait a minute. 
You could kill whoever you want, but you can't, they can't, you can't retaliate. That's right. And the United States is telling Iran, you can't retaliate. They're going to retaliate. Again, when all else fails, they take you to war. Look at the protests going on right now in Israel against Netanyahu. They want him out of there. You even heard little Chucky Schumer, the United States senator from New York. You know, the, the guy that wears his glasses like this. and <laughs> Yeah, that guy saying, Netanyahu, I got to go. Netanyahu's ramping it up. If this thing escalates, it's going to be, it's, it's World War Three. Where is World War Three's already begun. There's going to be an event that makes it, quote, official. So again, it's so easy. I just mentioned to you what happened with 9-11 when 88% of the people believe little Georgie Bush. Let's go back to about a month ago when three Americans were killed on the Jordan and Syrian border because of... Uh, 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 Hezbollah or somebody. What did the United States do? They bombed away over Syria and Iraq because three were dead. Now let's imagine if something bigger happens. They're going to escalate it. The U.S. obviously has to manage oil prices because, of course, the economy, you're saying that they want to keep the economy, uh, for the most part, uh, propped up at least until the election. So if they... If they have to balance these things out, because obviously if they go to war with Iran right now, oil prices are going to skyrocket and everything yep. is going to crash much sooner. We could also talk a little bit about how Trump is going to play into this, because it, it looks like he is uh, the choice for the election. How do you think the U.S. is going to modulate keeping oil prices down? Because now Biden, I'm sure you've heard, just said that they're not going to be refilling the strategic oil reserve. So there's a sign there that they might actually start drawing from it once again as oil prices creep up. So they're almost faced with, they got to make a choice, either they're going to take us to war and the oil price is going to skyrocket, or they're going to try to put Netanyahu and his plan on ice, at least until Trump is elected. No, they're not, they can't, Netanyahu's on his own. He's not going to do what America tells him to do, and he's doing what he wants to do. This is, by the way, what we do is trend forecasters, again, we don't take sides. We look at all the information. So in our research, what we do, for example, we're talking about the Israel war, you know, we subscribe to Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. We go to Times of Israel, uh, uh, Jerusalem Post. But then we also go to IRNA, ISNA, Tehran Times. We go to Al Jazeera. We want to hear what everybody's saying. And then we, then we give our analysis. So this is what they're saying. Here's our trends analysis. Here's our forecast. This is from um, the uh, ISNA, the uh, Iranian Student News Agency. Israel will regret Damascus assassination, supreme leader. We will make them regret committing this crime, he said. The evil regime of Israel will be punished by the hands of our brave men. And it goes on. As we used to say in the Bronx, payback's a bitch. It's going to escalate. The United States has lost control of this. And again, they speak out of both sides of their mouth. They say, oh, Israel shouldn't be doing this, doing that. Where they just passed the bill, they just, they just sent them another, what, over $2 billion worth of bombs? They're pushing another one for $18 billion in, 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 in military equipment and planes to go to Israel? So they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. Again, I'm not making this up. These are the facts. So I need them more and more weapons to keep this thing going on. Well, it's one thing I like about you, man. It's, one of, it's why you're one of the few people I can stand to listen to anymore is because you do really hold fast to this uh, political, I would call it agnosticism. I consider myself a political agnostic as well. And that's one thing that's hard to find nowadays. Is so many people are hyper-politicized. They think that Trump's going to be the savior. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. What happens if Trump gets into office? What will change? What will remain the same? It'll be, it'll be the divided states of America. 
And uh, again, Trump or Biden, as I said, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, you know. And again, they call America a democracy. Trump got $100 million from Sheldon Adelson when he ran for office in 2020. Trump was the guy that took the embassy from Tel Aviv and moved it to Jerusalem. Trump was the guy that said to, the, to Israel, yeah, you know that land you stole in the Golan Heights from Syria? It's yours. Yeah, that's the Trump. Trump's the son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who just came out and said how wonderful that oceanfront property is over there uh, in, in, in Gaza and how they should move out into the desert. Oh, the Kushner, his son-in-law, where when Netanyahu comes to America, he stays with the Kushners, that, that, that family. All right, that's on one side. And then you look at the other side. It's the same thing. It will be more of, regardless of who wins, America goes down. People call it a government. By their deeds, you shall know them. I just talked about the $29 trillion to bail out the banksters. That's only a little part of it. They're murderers and thieves. Both parties. They've destroyed the country. The big zone, everything. 63% of American people are living paycheck to paycheck. Oh, we're we talking about the, the office building bus where I am, I'm up here in Kingston, New York, which is 90 miles north of New York City. This is the third um, uh, settlement. And it, there are more pre-revolutionary war stone buildings here than anywhere else in America. And I own three of the most historic ones. And I bought them because the seeds of democracy were sown here. Anyway, flooding out of New York City and coming up here. Flooding out of New York City and coming up here. Because everything going down so bad. Whoever wins, the people lose. This thing has gone down to crap. So what do you think and happens then if Israel, like right now, they're... I mean, obviously Netanyahu is milking this because he can suppress he can suppress the protests as long as people are scared of Iranian retaliation. Yep. But I think what's probably going to happen is, uh, you know, if a war does start and Israel will be easily overwhelmed by all the proxies within the region, do you think there's a prospect of them uh, resorting to the Samson option? Absolutely. And again, most people don't never heard that term. And the Samson option, again, is what they have between 200 to 400 nuclear warheads. And if they go down, they're taking everybody down with them. Absolutely. Look at what's going on in front of everybody's eyes. The slaughter of the Palestinians. We're getting Hamas. What are you, who are you talking to? You're knocking down all those hospitals so you can't, people can't be, after they're wounded, what do you guys, oh, is it? Some 80,000 seriously wounded, 33,000 dead, 40% of them children, 30% of them women. Hamas lives there. Blow it up. Who are you talking to? Again, the words out of Jared Kushner's mouth. Oh, by the way, since October 7th, Israel has stolen nearly seven thousand more acres of palestinian land in the west bank oh no these are settlements who are you talking to what are you talking settlements you mean a violation of the geneva convention and article 242 of the united nations you're stealing their land oh, oh that's like the french going into algeria stealing their land oh and if you fight back you're a militant you're a terrorist. God gave us this land. Oh, it says it right there. Chapter six, section eight. Who are you talking to? You? God gave you this land. Save it, man. I don't want it. You don't have to believe in my God. Don't tell me I got to believe in your God story. They're stealing land in front of everybody's eyes. They're making a terrible situation worse. And you were talking about the Samson option. Let's go back to 1973 when the Arab countries put an embargo on oil in the United States. And look what happened to oil prices and inflation. If the Arab nations put an embargo on oil because of what Israel is doing, that's it, man. Oil prices will skyrocket. The global economy will crash. It's, it's kind of scary to see this happening before our eyes while the world just sits back and watches and lets uh, them operate with impunity. It's somewhat 
also similar to what's happening in Ukraine, where they're basically scooping guys off the streets and sending them to the trenches. Uh, perhaps we can shift the conversation to what's what's going to go on there. What is your forecast for the Ukraine situation? I, I heard recently that Zelensky bought some property in the UK. Is he planning yeah. on taking a sabbatical? or? <laughs> This is your Trends Journal magazine from spring of 2014. So how happy that guy is. This is the United States overthrow of the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine. Brought to you by Victoria Nuland, passing out cookies and candy in Maiden Square, along with John McCain, getting caught on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt, the United States ambassador to Ukraine saying F the EU, we're going to put Yats in there, Yats in York, after they threw him out. This article was written by Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. Washington is driving the world to the final war. Ukraine presented the perfect opportunity for Washington to advance its hegemonic agenda. In a speech at the National Press Club last December, meaning December 2013, and I suggest that people want to know the facts. Google up Victoria Newland National Press Club, December 2013, and listen to what she had to say. And by the way, over her shoulders, Exxon Mobil sign and Chevron. Newland boasted that Washington had invested five billion dollars in non-governmental organizations, NGOs in Ukraine for the purpose to teach democracy. They overthrew the government. People don't know anything about the facts. First of all, what's going on between Ukraine and Russia has only been going on since Catherine the Great. Number two, what happened was, oh, by the way, you could go to Ukrainian websites. This just came out this week, the number one concern of the Ukrainian people, according to the latest Ukrainian poll, is government corruption. Yep. After the war. That's the number one concerns. Go back to this time. Ukraine was broke. They went broke since the breakup of the Soviet Union. The European Union called them the most corrupt country in Europe. Go back. They needed money. He was going to borrow money from the IMF and the EU. The, was it the International Mafia? Oh, Monetary Fund. And the EU, Putin said, listen, I got a better deal for you. I'm going to give you lower interest rates and I'm going to lower the price of your oil and gas. That was the beginning of the overthrow. This is going, you ask me what's going to happen. We've been warning, writing in the Trends Journal, our forecasts. That Ukraine is going to escalate this war and to get more money, and there's going to be a major false flag event, whether it's a blowing up of a nuclear power plant, something that's going to escalate this war. And you just saw what happened a few weeks ago with the bombing of that concert hall. It's going to be much more of that. They're already bombing deeper and deeper into Russia. And we said this is going to happen. This war is going to escalate. Again, that guy Stoltenberg, that little creep, the head of the uh, NATO secretary general, $100 billion they want to spend to give to Kiev. $100 billion. What do you think the prospect of troop deployments, uh, NATO troop deployments in Ukraine is, and what effect might that have on the outcome of the conflict? They're already there. You go back. I mean, they call them... Uh, uh, advisors. Again, we wrote about this as it was happening. You got the guy Lloyd Austin, who's the United States Secretary of Defense. You had a Lloyd Austin that was a general that murdered people people in Iraq and Syria. That Lloyd Austin, oh, what was his last job? Oh, sitting on the board of directors of Raytheon, the second largest defense contractor in the United States. Yeah, that Lloyd Austin. We quoted him back about a year ago, a little, about, about eight months ago or so, saying that we had 
military advisors in Ukraine, so they make sure that the weapons that the United States has sent there, that they are efficiently used and not blah, 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 blah. And now you, it's one after another. They're coming out and they're actually saying that um, there are troops there. Russia's saying that there are troops there. So it's already there. So And then when you heard Blinken come out, little daddy's boy, uh, Anthony Blinken, America's uh, Secretary of State. I went to Dalton. I went to Harvard. Don't you know my daddy was the ambassador to... So hungry, my 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 uncle was the ambassador to Belgium. You're just a little nobody. I'm Anthony Blinken. I've been sucking off the public tit all my life. NATO's gonna, Ukraine's gonna be part of NATO. The deal is that if there's a war against a NATO country, we're all in. Got it. And so we're not ready for that. So that's going to require immense amounts of military mobilization. So perhaps this is what you're referring to when, are you talking about a war economy to get us out of the coming depression? Is that what they're going to do? No, no, no. They, they, again, the United States has not won a war since World War II. There's no way in the world that the United States and NATO are going to beat the, the, the Russians. Again, mention that, that Kennedy address uh, to the graduating students, June of 1961. It was all about peace. He warns not to go to war against the Soviet Union. He said, first of all, if there's a war, an atomic war will be wiped out within 24 hours. But he also went on to say that no country suffered more than the Soviet Union, the Russians, during World War II. They lost over 20 million people, he said. The numbers now are 25 million. In their land, they lost factories, homes, farms, the equivalent of Chicago to the East Coast. The Russians were the first ones to beat. That was Operation Barbarossa launched by Hitler. The Russians were the first ones to beat the Germans in World War II. There's no way the United States and NATO, this is just going to be nuclear war. It's going to be annihilation of life on earth. You got crazy people in charge. They're out of their minds. You don't ask a murderer why they were a murderer. You don't ask a thief why they were a thief. The people running the world, again, it's your cover of your Trends Journal, democracy. We got these clowns over there and it is still light. They're out of their minds. And look at that little boy Macron over there in France. So we're going to send 20,000 troops there, he said, if we have to. But look at his poll ratings. They're in the toilet. Look at Schultz of, of Germany's poll ratings down the toilet. Look at Sunak over there in the UK, down in the toilet, talking more war. These are mentally deranged people. Oh, by the way, I also launched a movement called Occupy Peace over a decade ago. So I just don't talk about this. I fight for peace. I'm a warrior for the Prince of Peace. So it's not like these are empty words. I do everything I can. And could you imagine if the billionaires gave us a billion dollars for peace movement? Oh, yeah. Ah, screw you. What billion dollars? What gave you nothing? Nothing. We know that the billionaires, uh, they have a backup plan. They have a plan for what they're going to do, or so they think anyways, when the shit hits the fan. Uh, what advice can you give? I know you don't have much more time, but uh, what uh, advice would you give for young people who are looking at the future and they're looking at this very uh, very complicated and foreboding states of, state of affairs, what advice do you have for them in terms of investments and just preparedness in general? All right, we, we, are, we don't give financial advice, speaking for myself. And by the way, before I get into that real quickly, Jared Kushner calls the Gaza waterfront prop calls Gaza waterfront property valuable. This is the thing that he said, quote, it's a little bit of an unfortunate situation there, talking about the genocide going on in Gaza and the slaughter of these people, they're losing their homes and just totally destroyed. He calls it a bit of an un unfortunate situation. That shows you what a piece of scum this guy is. He goes on, but... From Israel's perspective, hey, hey, it got sown. Who are you to? I'm an American. 
What do I care about Israel's perspective? Oh, don't you understand? I just told you, my father, you know, he's, oh, by the way, Trump pardoned his father. His father was brought up on crime charges and in jail. His father gave a million dollars to Trump campaign to, to, to give him a pardon before Trump got out of office. Yeah, it's a crime syndicate. Anyway, he goes, it's a little bit of an unfortunate situation there, but from Israel's perspective, I would do my best to move the people, the Palestinians, to move the people out and then clean it up. He added that Israel should move the Palestinian civilians into the Negev desert. It's kind of ironic, too, knowing the history of uh, people uh, straight... Uh, trying to survive in the desert. What was it, for 40 years or something like that? Yeah, genocide. This is the definition from the Oxford Dictionary. The deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Genocide. Right in front of your eyes. So going on to what you said, what should people do? Get in the best shape you can, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You're in the fight for your life, and you got to be in the best shape for it. And try to do something positive every day to help anybody that you can in any way that you can. And those that you're working with that do a great job, whether it's doing construction work or doing office work or whatever it might be, and you really appreciate what they're doing, and if you have the money or whatever you can do to do it, to, to give them more in any way that you can, as little bonuses here and there, do what you can. But again, try to help the people that need the help the most. And again, support peace, because if we don't have peace on earth, it's going to be hell on earth. And there's a, uh, I'm an American. As I say, I'm only me, because I'm a Napolitano, born in the Bronx, born to be free. I'm born right after World War II. I'm born in 46. The height, the height of the American spirit. You're free to be you. I believe, and the reason I own three of the most historic buildings in America, because the seeds of democracy were sown here. Kingston was burnt down by the British after the Battle of Saratoga. But the Constitution that was written for New York State, right across the street over here, over 70% of America's Constitution comes from here. And John Jay, the famous Supreme Court judge, he was a judge over here. This is from George Washington's farewell address. A real man that fought, not like these little boys like the Nobel Peace of Crap Prize like Obama that couldn't fight his way out of a paper bag, or little Billy Clinton, or, or Georgie e. Bush. A real, a real man that was president, a general, it is our true policy, this is farewell address, George Washington, to steer clear of any permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world. Observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. The nation which indulges toward another an habitual hatred like we have been taught to hate Russia since I'm a little kid hiding under a desk in case an atom bomb went off. The nation which indulges toward another an habitual hatred or an habitual fondness like, oh, we love Israel, we love Ukraine, is in some degree a slave it is a slave to its animosity or to its affection. Sympathy for the favorite nation, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists and infusing into one the enemies of the other betrays the former into a participation in the quarrels and wars of the latter without adequate inducement or justification. Here we are. So when you say 
you know, people should be at their best. Do you have a, a plan? I know you're in New York City right now. Are you planning on uh, riding this out uh, as bad as it gets? Or do you have a bug out plan? Do you have, I know you always say gold's gun and a getaway plan. What is your plan if things go bad? You know, if, if there's a nuclear war, I want to die. I don't want to live after that. You know, I just I hope that if they what happens, I'm right near it so I could get wiped out. I mean, imagine being in a bunker. A life will be wonderful after a nuclear annihilation. And again, Kennedy said life will be destroyed in 24 hours. That was 1963. And we would be, be destroyed for generations. Look how life hasn't come back after the COVID war. Look how everything has changed so dramatically. Now, we need peace. And I want to mention, this is very important. This is from your Trends Journal. I call this a Crusades 2000. I had forecast this was going to happen. This is back in 2006. Again, talking about what's going on in Israel. Israel, it's a made-up place. Regardless of what England's reasons or intentions were, self-serving or otherwise, Crusades 2000 was set in motion by the 1917 Balfour Declaration. Oh, Balfour Declaration that laid the foundation for Israel. Quote, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And we will use our best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this objective. 1917. His Majesty's government, some little bastard over there in the, in, where the sun never sets on the British Empire, we are slaughtering people all over the world. Who are you to say should be we going on in Palestine? Oh, I'm His Majesty. I don't pee or poo. I am higher than you. His Majesty's government? Oh, brought to you by the Rothschilds. Look it up. They have no right to this land. It was stolen. When the United Nations declared Israel, 56 nations belong to the United Nations. They had no right doing this. That's after they threw the Ottoman Empire out of there. This is a peaceful settlement land for everybody at one time. And I said, don't call me an anti-Semite. The people running Israel aren't Samites. The Ashkenazi Jews from northeastern Turkey up in that region once upon a time. The Semites are Palestinians from the Mesopotamia region. And don't say that I'm anti-Jewish. I'm not anti-American because I hate Americans' wars. And again, three of my last four girlfriends were Jewish. And my best friends are Jewish. And everyone except one of my Jewish friends are totally opposed to what's going on. Totally opposed to it. Oh, there's Jewish voices of peace that's against it. Oh, Norm Finkelstein, totally opposed to it. Max Blumenthal, totally opposed to it. So this is propaganda that they just put out there to shut you up. We need peace. So what I'm saying, everybody, do everything you can in the God that you believe in. Oh, in God we trust on all the American currencies. What God are you talking about? We need peace. So I'm saying get in the best shape you can, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, the reason I'm here is because of the beauty that I have here. And I just love what I have. And I keep trying to create more and more of it. One of my great girlfriends, Marie Pierre from Paris, used to say that art is the way of finding the true meaning of the human spirit. And I believe that with all my heart because once upon a time after the Black Plague, it was a renaissance. The people realized how screwed up they were. A la Romana, a la Antique, in the manner of the Romans and the ancients to describe the quality of their work. And that's what we have to do. We need a renaissance to bring back the true meaning of the human spirit. Well, I think that's a great place to end it, Gerald. And I want to uh, thank you for coming on today. And I would encourage people to check out the Trends Journal once again. Uh, it's such a, like, what is this? Two fifty a week or something like that. And it's $2 uh, and 50, $2 and 50 cents. So the price of a newspaper, discount, only yeah. this is real news. And it's like 150 plus pages long. 
And you go into everything. I mean, we could have talked about AI. We could have talked about bird flu. We could have talked about, you know, pretty much everything you touch on in here. And, you know, I, I say this, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but I, I'm sort of on the same arc as you are with this trend forecasting thing. And mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot to just, you know, take a bit of time to look at the data and then just, just try to make educated guesses, apolitical educated guesses on the basis of that. And if more people did that, then maybe we wouldn't find ourselves in these uh, predicaments where we have to go down this pathway to World War Three. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what you said. You know, it's it's those of us that care. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men, said Samuel Adams, one of the founding fathers. And we are, I am irate. I'm angry. Once upon a time, there was this guy by the name of Tom, St. Thomas Aquinas. You could look it up. Any person that is not angry when it's morally justifiable to be angry is immoral for not being angry. And again, the Prince of Peace became violent to drive the money changes out. So we have to unite for peace and change it. When we could do it, Again, I've been on the other side. You can get rid of these people like that. Like that. They won't fight back. And we can do it peacefully. It's up to the people to do it. And we can do it. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high-quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk, and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.